Today, I'll be speaking about metabolic engineering. Really, the subtitle of this lecture is Understanding the Molecular Biology of Wellness. So it begins with, what actually is wellness? Well, a typical definition might be, if drugs treat the symptoms of chronic disease, then wellness must be the absence of the symptoms of chronic disease. That's a possible definition, but it doesn't take into account that it takes years for oftentimes for those symptoms of chronic disease to begin to appear. So what are some other potential definitions of wellness? One might be, I'm just lucky. And that's good for you, but not very good for basically helping somebody else to achieve wellness. Another definition might be, I have good genes. A great for you, but again, very hard to transmit to someone else. But there's a third definition of wellness, in my opinion, and this is the absence of insulin resistance. This begins to beg the question, what exactly is insulin resistance? Well, insulin resistance is when your metabolism is not working correctly. How can you tell? You can't look at a person because 16% of normal weight individuals have severe insulin resistance. But usually the first physical indication that you have insulin resistance is the accumulation of abdominal fat, also known as belly fat. And that is indication that you now are moving as a gateway toward many chronic disease states. The primary cause of insulin resistance is a pro-inflammatory diet. So again, it begs the question, how do you define a pro-inflammatory diet? There are three components. One could be excess nutrients. You're consuming too many calories. Or consuming too many simple sugars like glucose or fructose. Or consuming too many refined carbohydrates like bread, pasta, rice, and potatoes. And also consuming excess levels of omega-6 fatty acids and the saturated fat, palmitic acid. Another category is being deficit in certain nutrients. These would include omega-3 fatty acids and polyphenols. And finally, you can have an unbalanced ratio of protein to carbohydrate in your diet. Any one of these three factors can give rise to insulin resistance. And the more of the three factors you have, the greater the levels of insulin resistance you carry in your body. Why is this important? Because the consequences of insulin resistance is the increased formation of inflammation. This was the a Time magazine cover back in 2004 talking about the secret killer, the surprising link between inflammation, heart attacks, cancer, Alzheimer's, and other diseases. You would think from this cover that if we could only stop inflammation, turn it off completely, we'd be in a state of wellness. But oftentimes biology is far more complex. Because what you need is a zone, a zone of inflammation. <clears throat> if we had too little of an inflammatory response, our bodies would become a sitting target for microbes. Our physical injuries would never heal. But if the inflammatory response is too strong, then inflammation is not resolved and the body begins to attack itself. So now we can begin to look at wellness as maintaining a zone of inflammation. Not too high, but not too low. So here's our current understanding of inflammation. Inflammation causes damage, damage to every organ in our body. But it's the resolution, which is the scientific term for turning off of inflammation, that leads to healing. So if inflammation causes damage, what controls healing? The answer is a very complex of metabolic state called the resolution response. And basically, this is how it works. If the body is exposed to any type of injury, there's acute inflammation. You see a rise of inflammatory meters like acosinoids or cytokines. 
But that rise in those inflammatory meteors now turns on an otherwise quiet resolution response. And this is far more complex because it has many different uh, components, but they look to reduce inflammation, resolve it, that means turning it off, and repairing the damaged tissue. And if all three of those components of the resolution response are working correctly, the damage heals. So what exactly is this resolution response? It's the healing. It's how the body heals. It requires an on-demand resolution response to repair damaged tissue caused by any source of inflammation, including a pro-inflammatory diet. It's an orchestrated series of hormonal and epigenetic actions that cause our body to heal. But with the most important aspect, each step of the resolution response can be blocked by the presence of insulin resistance. And this is the key of why insulin resistance becomes a key to understanding wellness. Because the more insulin resistance you have, it blocks the resolution response by re disrupting your metabolism. So this begs still another question. What exactly is metabolism? It does convert food into energy. Without metabolism, we would die. But it also controls your immune system. It also controls the expression of your genes via epigenetics. It controls tissue regeneration. And it controls your rate of aging. It's a pretty impressive list. And that's because metabolism is incredibly complex. And this can show actually what happens in only one cell in your body. And remember, you have 37 trillion cells in your body. This is what metabolism does. It gets signals from outside the cell. It could be nutrients, it could be hormones, it could be other compounds. But that basically now sets off a series of very complex and dynamic actions inside a cell. And if those, if those uh, combination of actions are working well, your metabolism is efficient and you stay well. As complex as this side might be, actually, there's a more complex part of metabolism. These are the signaling systems that control metabolism. They're far more complex. And these signaling systems basically turn cell function and cell metabolism on and off on a second-by-second -second basis. No drug can do this. But basically, your diet can orchestrate can orchestrate this complex signaling system to basically maintain wellness. And the key to that is the master switch of metabolism in each of your 37 trillion cells, known as AMPK. Now here are the primary complications as your levels of insulin resistance or disruption of your metabolism increase. Think of this like a champagne fountain that you basically, as insulin resistance gets larger or higher and higher in your body, it fills up the first tier of that champagne. It spills over in the second tier. And what does that give us rise to? Diabetes. Diabetes is usually the first chronic disease state that occurs with long-term uh, insulin resistance. But once you get diabetes, your troubles are only just now beginning. Because once you have diabetes, that spills over into the next tier of heart disease, and your likelihood of getting heart disease is now four times greater. And furthermore, as you get maintained insulin resistance for a longer period of time, it now spills over into Alzheimer's. And that's why, again, that once you have diabetes, you're twice as likely to get Alzheimer's. All three of these seemingly different diseases are linked to long-term exposure to insulin resistance. And those aren't the only ones. We talked about obesity. We talked about diabetes, hypertension, cancers, fatty liver disease, neurodegenerative diseases like uh, Parkinson's and uh, you know, depression. We also have things like kidney disease, heart disease, and frailty. These are the primary diseases that cause us to age at a faster rate. And yet they're all controlled by your metabolism that can be disrupted by increasing levels of insulin resistance. 
That being the case, how do we measure this? This sounds like a very destructive force. If we can't measure it, how can we turn it off? Well, actually we can measure it. It's a very simple test. It's called the homeostatic assessment of insulin resistance, or HOMA-IR. And you only need two blood tests to calculate this. One, your fasting glucose, and the other is your fasting insulin levels. You put them in a simple equation, and out comes a number. If the number is less than one, you have no insulin resistance. In other words, and that's another way of saying you're well. Between one and two, you're no longer well, but you're not yet sick. But you're kind of normal, and that's why I put that in quotation marks. But by the time it raises beyond two and gets higher, basically now your metabolism is becoming increasingly disrupted, and your likelihood of developing chronic disease is dramatically enhanced. And not surprisingly, insulin resistance is epidemic in the United States. In the year 22, that's about 21 years ago, only 5% of Americans had a HOMA IR of less than one, which meant only 5% of Americans 20 years ago could be considered to be well. Today, the number is far lower. Today, the average HOMA IR of non-diabetic Americans is 2.7. And that explains why our health care costs are going up exponentially. Because we're in an epidemic of insulin resistance that causes disruption of our metabolism that speeds up the development of chronic disease. But sometimes the looks can be deceiving, but taking prescription drugs are not. I said earlier, about 16% of normal weight individuals have severe insulin resistance. They're no longer well. In fact, they're fast-tracking toward chronic disease, but they look good in a swimsuit. But if you're taking a drug for a chronic condition, especially a metabolic condition, you're likely to have insulin resistance. <laughs> well, we know two things in America. Most people no longer look good in swimsuits, and Americans are taking lots of drugs. That tells us right off the bat that a lot of Americans have severe insulin resistance. Now, that being the case, how do you reduce it? To reduce it, you've got to turn on that master switch of metabolism in every one of your 37 trillion cells. It's called AMPK. And if you can do this, then you basically have the, the key to the kingdom the key to basically reprogramming your metabolism to live a longer and better life. Because once you activate AMPK, your cholesterol levels go down, your inflammation levels go down, your blood sugar levels go down, your blood flow increases, your ability to make new mitochondria increases, you basically reduce the production of body fat, you burn stored body fat faster. These all the things are that make you live longer and they're all controlled by your metabolism, which is ultimately controlled by AMPK. With that as a background, now we can pose the question, what exactly is this concept of metabolic engineering? It sounds a little like genetic engineering. It is, except it's more complex, because metabolism is far more complex than simple genetics. What metabolic engineering actually is, it allows you to reprogram your metabolism by activating AMPK in each of your 37 trillion cells. Not by using a drug, but using your diet as if it were a drug. Be taken at the right dosage at the right time. And here are the three dietary activators of AMPK. The most powerful is restricting calories. You're saying, oh, who wants to restrict calories and be hungry all the time? The answer is no one. But what if you could restrict calories and never be hungry? People say, that would be the impossible dream. Well, have we seen a new injectable weight loss drugs like Wagovi say, if I take my injection of Wagovi, I'm not hungry. That means you're reducing calories. But can you do it by diet? The answer is yes, and I'll show you shortly how that can be done. But that's not the only dietary activator of AMPK. 
Another one is adequate levels of omega-3 fatty acids in the diet. They make powerful hormones called resolvents that also activate AMPK. And there are also polyphenols. These are the chemicals that give fruits and vegetables their color. In high enough concentrations, they too can activate AMPK. So your diet provides a number of opportunities to activate the master switch of metabolism, and by doing so, you can now reduce uh, insulin resistance and the benefits to you. You live longer, you live better. Here are the basic dietary components of metabolic engineering. The foundation, the foundation is you have to restrict calories. You can't get away from this. But you also need omega-3 fatty acids and polyphenols. And if you have all three components as part of your dietary system, you have the keys to the kingdom, the keys to not only reduce insulin resistance, but by activating AMPK, you can now basically maintain wellness for a lifetime. But here are some basic questions. We talk about polyphenols, which ones? There are 8,000. We talk about omega-3 fatty acids, how much? And calorie restriction, how do you stop hunger but without, but without fatigue and the least effort on your part? Let's start with the polyphenols first. Why do we need them? At the molecular level, they reduce oxidative stress. These are free radicals, and they're indirect activators of AMPK. But if they're not in your diet in sufficient levels, you'll have high levels of oxidative stress, and that will basically cause insulin resistance. Well, here are the problems with polyphenols if you are eating fruits and vegetables. They're found in very low concentrations which means you have to eat a lot of fruits and vegetables to get adequate levels. What's a lot? About 10 servings of fruits and vegetables per day. That sounds to many like Mission Impossible. But even if you ate 10 servings of fruits and vegetables per day, you have another problem. They're not very well absorbed. If they can't get in the body, they can't basically activate AMPK. And finally, if they do get in the body, they leave the body fairly quickly. Their lifetime in the blood is very short, which means that basically to use polyphenols correctly, I'd be consuming them throughout the day in adequate levels. Now, a little science, about very little science, the polyphenols, what they do, they activate a gene transcription factor called sirtuin. This goes through a series of reactions that activates AMPK, and this act activation of ABK gives rise to reduction of the insulin resistance. <clears throat> now, let's go back to the practical. And this shows one of the problems we have with polyphenols just uh, as a general class. This is a study done in Italy in over, over a decade ago, taking people who still follow the old Mediterranean diet, living in the hills of Tuscany, and asking the question, perhaps those who ate the most polyphenols would basically survive the longest. These are old individuals, so they say, let's see who basically dies the fastest. And ideally, those who die the fastest should be consuming the least amount of polyphenols. Well, the graph was shown on, on the results are shown in graph B. As you see, the amount of polyphenols they consume appear to have absolutely no relationship to the rate of dying. This made no sense to the, the researchers. So they said, wait a minute, maybe the polyphenols have to get into the blood to work. And if they get in the blood, they're hard to measure, but when they leave the blood, they leave through the urine. So maybe by measuring the urine, we can see who is eating the most polyphenols that actually got into the blood. And this is shown in graph A. Now they found what they were looking for. Those who had the greatest levels of polyphenols in their urine had a 30% decrease in mortality. No drug, no other medical science can do that. But if you consume enough polyphenols to get into the blood, it's possible. Now, I said earlier, there's 8,000 polyphenols. Which ones? Well, probably the ones which are the most water-soluble. 
Now that number of 8,000 comes down to a very small number. And the best of the best is one group of uh, polyphenols known as delphinidines. They're quite water soluble. And if you notice this picture, that they are quite uh, purple and almost reddish. And that's why the best source of delphinidines are berries, particularly berries and grapes that basically are used to make red wine. Because it's the delphinidines in the red wine that give it its red color. And that's basically the benefits of drinking red wine, not the alcohol. It's the amount of delphinidines. Now, what if you can concentrate these delphinidines up and give them to people who have basically insulin resistance, like those who are pre-diabetic? What happens? Their levels of insulin resistance goes down in a very short period of time. What if you give these delphinidines to individuals who basically have high levels of oxidative stroke, uh, stress? Who are people like this? They smoke cigarettes. Tell, tell a smoker to stop smoking. Not going to happen. So what they did in this study is to give the smokers either a placebo capsule or a capsule of delphinidine extracts, and they can see within 30 days their levels of oxidative stress that causes all the problems goes down dramatically. And when they stopped giving the delphinidines, it went right back up to its previous high level. Now, what about omega-3 fatty acids? These drive the resolution or the turning off of inflammation. But how much? That's the question. First of all, we have to think of inflammation from a new perspective. We think of inflammation as a raging fire that burns out the embers. Great image simply isn't scientifically true. What inflammation does, it might reduce its intensity below the perception of pain, but it keeps on burning. This is known as chronic low-level inflammation. It's below the perception of pain, so considered to be silent pain. Though you might not feel it, it's causing organ damage throughout your body. So, that being the case, how do omega-3 fatty acids resolve or turn off this chronic low-level inflammation? They do it by these newly discovered hormones called resolvins. These are the most powerful hormones known in medical science. And yet, we cannot make them unless we have adequate levels of omega-3 fatty acids in the blood. But if we do make them, basically they have remarkable actions in terms of reducing inflammation and basically promoting the resolution response to cause healing of damaged tissue. And here's the typical time course of inflammation. There's the initiation. This is when you get the heat, the pain, the swelling, the redness. It's called edema. But now this is accompanied by infiltration of immune cells, they're called neutrophils, into the damaged site. And they cause even more destruction. And then they bring in their cousins, called macrophages, to cause even more destruction. But somehow, magically, magically, during this course, as the macrophages are entering the damaged zone, they get converted from pro-inflammatory to anti-inflammatory. And now they clean up all the dead cells. They clean up the dead neutrophils. They clean up the dead cells, and they begin the healing process. And if the resolution response is completed, the tissue heals completely, as if you've turned back the hands of time. Now, how do you know if you have adequate levels of omega-3 fatty acids in the blood? There's a simple blood test. You can done it with a finger stick. It measures the levels of two fatty acids. One is called arachidonic acid, or AA, and the other is called eicosapentaenoic acid, or EPA. It's the balance of these two fatty acids that will tell you, with precision, your ability to turn on or turn off inflammation. So the question is, how many of these omega-3 fatty acids do I need to basically turn off inflammation? The answer is, it depends. It depends on how well you are. It depends what type of chronic disease states you have. Let's say you think you're well. 
you look good in a swimsuit, and uh, you have no obvious chronic disease state. How much will you need of omega-3 fatty acids on a daily basis to make sure you have adequate substrates or building blocks to make these resolvents? The answer is about two and a half grams per day. Your great-grandmother knew this when she gave your grandparents a tablespoon of cod liver oil. That contained about two and a half grams of omega-3 fatty acids, but no child could leave the house three generations ago until they had a tablespoon of cod liver oil. Today, the average intake of cod, uh, omega-3 fatty acids is not two and a half grams. It's about 100 milligrams, or a 95% reduction which means in the course of three generations, our ability to turn off inflammation has decreased by 95%. But what if you're not well? What if you're obese? You have diabetes or heart disease. You'll need more. And what if you have now chronic pain? It's no longer silent pain, but chronic pain, like the chronic pain of rheumatoid arthritis. The levels are still higher. And what if you have now inflammation inside the brain? You have depression. You have anxiety. You have ADHD. You have Parkinson's. You have Alzheimer's. Multiple sclerosis. You still need higher levels. Make the mistake, these are high levels, but they're also therapeutic levels needed to resolve inflammation to basically return to a state of wellness. But rather than guessing, testing is always better. That's why there's actually simple blood tests. Simple blood tests that can be done with a finger stick. It will tell you the ratio of those two key fatty acids. You want between 1.5 and 3. That's your target zone. And if you can achieve that, then you basically you are able to basically control the balance of inflammation and resolution with frightening precision. But as that ratio gets higher and higher and higher, you have less control of the control of inflammation and you have more chronic inflammation. For example, the average American, the ratio is about 20. That's a little higher than about uh, the 1.5 you want to be at. So your goal is to go from the poor to the target zone. And in that target zone, you're able to control inflammation and therefore reduce inflama uh, re insulin resistance to a greater degree. So far, so good. Because taking supplements, it's easy. But changing dietary habits, that's incredibly hard. Because there are many dietary inhibitors of AMPK. The polyphenols, and the uh, omega-3 fatty acids, they increase the activity of AMPK. But there are many things in your diet that decrease its activity. One, consuming excess calories. Two, consuming excess glucose. There are also indirect inhibitors, consuming excess fructose or excess protein. And for most Americans, they do all four of these simultaneously. So any benefits of supplementation can be wiped out by your diet. And this is why you ultimately need the zone diet for ultimate success in maintaining, achieving, and maintaining wellness. Think of, of your body as a, the large bucket. You can pour supplements into the bucket, but if that large bucket has holes, those supplements will have very little benefit. They leak out. What the zone diet does is to block the holes in that bucket so when you add the supplements to your diet they stay there and able to reduce now insulin resistance more effectively but this begs the question how to achieve calorie restriction without hunger people say it's impossible well not totally impossible here are your options because you want to do this on a lifetime basis one Gastric bypass surgery, introduced in about 2005. A little barbaric, but it works. But now we have a whole new generation of injectable drugs. But they must be taken for a lifetime, because the day you stop taking these injectable drugs, like Wolgovi, 
the desire for it, it becomes more and more impossible to reduce calories. More importantly, even though you lose weight on these drugs, about 40% of that weight loss is not fat, it's muscle, and also protein in all of your organs, like your heart, your liver, your kidney, and your brain. But you have a third option, and this is the zone diet. The zone diet is a highly defined diet, must be followed by, for a lifetime, like the injectable drugs. But here's the difference. You need about 30 grams of protein at every meal to induce satiety by the same mechanisms that the injectable weight loss drugs do. But it has to be balanced by low glycemic carbohydrates to control insulin. You have to keep insulin in a zone. Not too high, but not too low. And a new group of foods we've called zone foods make it easier to do. So now we can look at a more detailed dietary components of metabolic engineering. You need polyphenols, but they should be primarily delphinidines. You need omega-3 fatty acids, but the blood will tell you are you taking enough or not. And as terms of calorie restriction, the one that has the greatest likelihood of long-term success without complications will be the zone diet. The zone diet was not developed as a weight loss program. It was developed and patented to reduce insulin resistance. It was essentially developed as a drug. And if you reduce insulin resistance, good things happen. But the only way you can do that is by balancing the hormones in your blood by your diet and controlling the ratio of protein to the glycemic load. This is like having gained the best mileage from your car. You can't run your car all on gas, and you can't run it all on air. You need some combination for the best uh, mileage. The same is true of your diet. At every meal, you need the right balance of protein to the glycemic load. If you're eating too many carbohydrates, you will decrease AMPK activity, and insulin resistance increases. If you're eating too few carbohydrates, you're following a ketogenic diet, and now the body is deficit in glucose. And the body responds by increasing the hormone, the stress hormone, cortisol, to break down muscle mass to make glucose for the brain. And that cortisol increases insulin resistance. Between those two extremes lies the zone, where you can now basically reduce insulin resistance by simply controlling the balance of protein to carbohydrate the best you can at every meal. And if you can do that, the zone diet gives you a pathway of a calorie-restricted diet without hunger, without fatigue. And it's as simple as one, two, three. Step one, try to get 30 grams of protein at every meal. For dinner, easy. Lunch, difficult. Breakfast, almost impossible. But your goal is to get 30 grams at each meal. Step two, if you get that 30 grams of protein, you need to balance it with low glycemic carbohydrates, primarily non-starchy vegetables, just like your grandmother told you. You can't leave the table until you eat all your vegetables. Step three, add a dash. What's a dash? A small amount of monounsaturated fat. And what you've done in doing that, you've devised a powerful drug that for the next five hours will basically reduce insulin resistance and basically increase your ability to live a longer and better life. The problem is you have to repeat the process every five hours the rest of your life. Now, who on the science? Why do we start with protein? Well, because protein causes the release of hormones from the gut, exactly the same hormones that the weight loss drugs like Govi and Ozempic do by injections. Your dietary philosophy doesn't matter. I don't care if you're a vegan, a lacto ovo vegetarian or an omnivore. Just make sure you get adequate levels of protein at every meal. And the amount does matter. It should be at least 30 grams, but no less than 30 grams at each meal. 
Why no more? Because the more protein you consume at a meal, the more you increase insulin resistance. Now here's some examples of 30 grams of protein for different uh, dietary philosophies. If you're an omnivore, easy peasy. Four ounces of chicken, four ounces of lean beef, six ounces of fish. If you're a lacto-ovo vegetarian, eight egg whites or 12 ounces of Greek yogurt. If you're a vegan, it can be two cups of cooked beans or six ounces of firm tofu. A little more difficult for a vegan, but it can be done. But the fact is, there's no reason for your dietary philosophy to stop you from getting 30 grams of protein. And why? Because the protein contain, causes the release of hormones from the gut that go step, directly to the brain to say, stop eating. And that protein also stimulates hormones from the pancreas that stabilize blood sugar. If you can stabilize blood sugar, you won't be hungry because the brain is happy. Now, that's step one. Step two, you have to now balance with carbohydrates. How many? About 40 grams. But if you're consuming non-starchy of low glycemic carbohydrates like vegetables, it's incredibly hard to overconsume 40 grams of carbohydrates. And the best ones? The ABCs. Asparagus, artichokes, uh, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, spinach. More importantly, these carbohydrates also contain fiber that's metabolized in your gut into short-chain fatty acids that enhance the actions of the satiety hormones. So it's a combination of protein with the fiber that make these hormones work better than the ones that you inject with using Wagovi. And finally, you add a dash of monounsaturated fat. That can be a tablespoon of extra virgin olive oil, 14 almonds, or two tablespoons of guacamole. That's it. Just do it the best you can every time you eat for the rest of your life. So let's put it all together. You do all this, you consume about 400 calories per meal. You're getting adequate protein. Not too much, not too little. You're getting moderate amounts of carbohydrates with more than adequate fiber. And it's a low-fat meal. Who could argue with that? Now, does it work? The key thing about science, it's reproducible. If it's reproducible, it can be basically done in clinical studies and get consistent results. This is some studies done at Harvard Medical School done in 1999. What they did was to bring in overweight, uh, obese children from Harvard into Harvard Medical School on three separate occasions. And each time they'd bring them in the hospital overnight and would then basically wake them up in the morning and put catheters in their arms. So they take out blood samples to measure hormones. And then on each of the three meals or visits, they'd give them meals of equal number of calories, all containing 400 calories. Some meals had were high carbohydrate meals, rich in high, have a high glycemic load, like a typical breakfast cereal. Others would be high carbohydrate meals with a lower glycemic load, like oatmeal. And the third meal was a zone meal. All contained the same number of calories. So, what were the effect on the hormones? Well, they gave the children uh, the meal as soon as they woke up and then measure, started measuring their hormones. If we look at the hormone insulin, the two meals with the high carbohydrates, the insulin levels rose dramatically and dropped off sharply. But when they contained the zone meal, same number of calories, insulin levels did not rise very fast and they dropped off more slowly. But what about other hormones like glucagon? Glucagon is a hormone that raises and maintains blood sugar levels. On the two high carbohydrate meals, it was depressed. But on the zone meal, it was increased. It means blood sugar levels were being maintained. Now, what they did was to take now the catheters out of the arms of the child and give them exactly the same meal for lunch that they'd eaten for breakfast. And then they brought them into a conference room. A conference room filled with um, all sorts of goodies. 
donuts, candies, muffins, all things, you know, obese ch small children like to eat. And said, uh, enjoy yourself. You know, you can watch TV, read comic books, and if you want to eat something, go right ahead. Meanwhile, the Harvard research were taking very careful notes. And the children who consume, consumed two zone meals back to back consumed 46% fewer calories than eating the higher carbohydrate meals. Within two meals, without any type of uh, educational program or exercise program, they simply ate less calories. Why? Because they had better hormonal control. Now, that being said, does it lower insulin resistance? That's our marker of wellness. This is a study done in 1998 using the zone diet in both obese and type 2 diabetic patients. You can see at the start of the study, day one, they basically were both, uh, both groups had high levels of insulin resistance, the type 2 diabetics, obviously more. But by four days, the levels of insulin resistance before they had lost a pound of weight had been dramatically reduced. And by 28 days, even though now they were losing some weight, most of the drop occurred within the first four days. So this shows that HOMA IR, your marker of wellness, your marker of insulin resistance, can be rapidly lowered by the zone diet. Like I said, it's harder to get uh, 30 grams of protein than you think. I said dinner is easy, lunch is difficult, breakfast is impos almost impossible. But this is your goal. You want to basically keep that balance, that hormonal balance, throughout the day. Now, who might benefit from this type of diet? Obviously, type 2 diabetics. And this is work done at Harvard Medical School, where they use the zone diet as their primary tool to treat type 2 diabetes. And you see that these diabetics, when they started to follow the zone diet in the first three months, a dramatic reduction of their blood sugar levels. And they were already taking their prescribed drugs. But the zone diet made the drugs work better. But what happens over time? Life gets in the way. They tend to fall back in their old dietary habits, and slowly the levels of blood sugar levels begin to rise. Now, is there any way to get around this problem? I think there is. And that's why we invented a technology called zone foods. These are foods, basically are constructed foods, that provide adequate protein to induce satiety, but they're balanced with low glycemic loads, carbohydrates, to prevent excess insulin formation. But they're hedonically pleasing. They're fun to eat, and they're e easy to integrate into any dietary philosophy. What are some of these typical zone foods? Things like rice and pasta, bread and pizza, breakfast cereals, bars, shakes, muffins, cookies, soups. These are things people like to eat because they're easy. They're convenient. Here's our examples of some of the pasta meals they can make. They say, well, it looks like regular pasta with vegetables. That's right. Except the pasta is now the drug. It's the drug that turns off insulin resistance, and now they become a vegetable helper. They help you eat more vegetables. Likewise for rice. The rice is the drug. It's the drug that turns off basically insulin resistance, and now they become a vehicle to add even more vegetables to your diet. Or they be bread and pizza products. The bread or the pizza crust it is the drug. Now what you put on there just makes the drug easier to eat. But the drug is the bread. The drug is the pizza crust. Now, does it work? That's why you do clinical trials. Clinical trials say, here's the science. Does it work? It's either yes or no. This is our, our production team at Arizona State University where we did the study, making up controlled meals of either using the zone foods or the equivalent found in the uh, marketplace. And the, the participants would basically come in and get their foods ready to eat and would eat them not knowing whether they're getting the zone foods or the foods they'd find in the supermarket. So, what happened? Well, 
Remember this? And they were all put on calorie-restricted diets. Well, they all lost weight. So I said, well, that says it doesn't work. You have to look a little closer. When you look at lean body mass, which is basically your weight minus your body fat, you saw a dramatic difference. Those on the, eating the zone foods, they were actually gaining more lean body mass. They were eating less food, but gaining muscle. And it's highly statistically significant. In terms of fat loss, they were actually losing twice the levels of fat as those on the control group. We can put these numbers in perspective, compare them to Wagovi. On Wagovi, you lose weight. But in using Wagovi as a weight loss drug, injectable weight loss drug, about 40% of the weight loss is lean body mass. But here, using the zone foods, you gain lean body mass. And the fat loss was actually faster in the same time period using the zone foods than using injections of Wagovi. Fat loss is greater, is the same. The fat loss is greater, and they increase lean body mass, whereas Wagovi decreases lean body mass. But they both stop hunger. But most importantly, say what do they do in terms of insulin resistance? A dramatic drop. Now, those on the placebo, even though they're restricting calories, not much drop of insulin resistance. Those using the zone foods, a dramatic reduction. So, to summarize, if we want to reduce insulin resistance, we need an integrated dietary approach. You need the omega-3 fatty acids, you need the polyphenols, you need the zone diet. Each one is good in their own right, but when they're all combined, you're able to have its maximum impact on reducing insulin resistance. So, this is now how we define that amorphous term, the zone. In the zone, you are retaking control of your metabolism. You are reprogramming your metabolism by reducing insulin resistance. By maintaining HOMA IR less than one, you're optimizing AMPK activity, and it's that optimization of AMPK activity that leads to the slowing of the aging process. But sometimes you need a roadmap to get from point A to point B. And that's why the zone diet is highly personalized to your biochemistry. We're not all the same genetically. But we can basically change, use our blood to make adjustments in our diet to make sure our, we're staying in navigational channels. We can look at the ratio of triglycerides to HDL. That should always be less than one. That's most affected by the zone diet. The ratio of arachidonic acid to EPA that controls inflammation. This is most affected by omega-3 fatty acids. And glycosylated hemoglobin, uh, which is a marker of AMPK activity, is most affected by polyphenols. So by using our blood, we can keep adjusting our diet to make it personalized to our genetics and our biochemistry. So here are the key points of metabolic engineering. It's a system. It's not a magic bullet. It's a system to activate AMPK activity. And it's the activation of this master switch of metabolism that's the key to reducing insulin resistance, enhancing healing, and coordinating epigenetic signaling. What metabolic engineering is, is a defined dietary pathway to maintain wellness. But what about lifestyle? That has to be important. Of course it is. But how important? I use the 80-15-5 rule. 80% 80 of your ability to control and reduce insulin resistance will come from the diet. 15% from exercise and 5% from stress reduction. Don't kid yourself. Going taking yoga classes or doing exercise, they're good. You should want to do them but they'll have near, not nearly the impact of reducing insulin resistance in your diet. This also means a poor diet can overwhelm the benefits of exercise and stress reduction. So we come back to a concept of evidence-based wellness. We talk about evidence-based medicine, 
Would you take a drug that there's no clinical data to support its benefits? Of course you wouldn't. Say, show me the data. The same we should ask about our wellness programs. Wellness can be defined by your level of insulin resistance. It's like pregnancy. Either you are or you aren't pregnant. And likewise, either your HOMA IR is less than one or it's not. If it's less than one, you're well. If it's greater than one, you're not well. The blood doesn't lie. You use the blood to guide you how to basically live a longer and better life. And if you have insulin resistance, your future is bleak. But that's okay. It can be quickly changed. How? By using metabolic engineering.